Our story begins as the great ice sheets were advancing over the northern hemisphere, turning the world colder and drier. This was the Ice Age. And it belonged to the wolf. This vast landscape was their backyard. There were millions of wolves roaming the continents of the Northern Hemisphere. And whether they lived in the Arctic or the desert, they lived in packs. Our ancestors would have feared and admired the wolf's speed, stamina, and superior senses. The wolf pack was the perfect killing machine. Once they sniffed out prey, it was already too late. Working together, they were able to take down animals far larger than themselves. Wolf packs have a strict social order, led by an alpha male and alpha female. And the alphas got the choice bits, but the pack got its share too. And only the alpha female had pups. But just as it took the pack to bring down prey, the pack helped raise the young. A wolf pack was a family. And in that sense, they were just like us. Clan loyalty held us together too and kept us alive against tremendous Ice Age odds. Because for thousands of years, we trespassed in a world that was not ours. Back then, there were less than one million people on the entire planet. And if our ancestors felt like they were always being watched, it's because they were. Wolves, like us, are curious animals. For a carnivore with a nose a hundred times more sensitive than ours, the smell of cooking meat would have been an irresistible lure. They followed their noses to the edge of our camps and discovered an unexpected prize, our garbage. Even for this top predator, hunting was hard work that often went unrewarded. The most curious, least aggressive wolves discovered that there were rewards to be had living close to us. Our scraps became a new kind of fast food, and the camp wolf was born.
Professor of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, Dr. Robert Wayne, is the senior author of a new genetic analysis of wolves and dogs. I think it was initially a loose association. Wolves started following humans because they provided a resource and then kind of adopted the human niche. And those wolves, by just by the nature of that new habit, that is, they were no longer territorial, they were not hunting territorial prey, they were following humans, they were some kind of reproductive divergence. In time, the camp wolves living close to humans became genetically isolated from the wolves of the forests and wilderness. Eventually, in locations across the Middle East, Asia, and Europe, a new social order dawned. And the most curious humans and wolves were taking one small step toward the creation of the dog. This first timid contact began a dance between our two species that would change our world forever. There must have been something special about wolves which predisposed them towards domestication. And I think the real inkling of that is wolves were the only large carnivore that humans ever domesticated. Camp wolves became a familiar presence around our campsites. and we became more comfortable with them. These were perilous times for our ancestors. They were surrounded by animals bigger, stronger, and faster than us. When night fell, we huddled around our fires, wary of the danger from predators lurking in the darkness. It's likely the camp wolves' earliest service to humans was as an alarm to danger. In protecting her own young, this camp wolf unintentionally protected the humans.
But now her puffs were orphaned. The clan mothers could never have known that the cries of the wolf pups would trigger their brain chemistry, urging them to nurse for these babies just as they did their own. This brain chemical, oxytocin, is made by all mammals, and it's released through suckling and by warmth and repetitive touch. That night around the campfire, no pup or clan member was immune to the powerful connective chemistry being unleashed. Today, we are just beginning to understand how such simple acts of kindness can ignite the social brain chemistry that makes us less fearful and willing to develop social ties. The pups and clan members first felt this bond more than 32,000 years ago. As new generations from these orphaned pups were born, the camp wolf evolved into the proto-dog, the precursor to man's best friend. And with each new litter, our ancestors kept the tamest pups and shunned the rest. Early on, any wolf that hinted at aggression or a protodog that hinted at aggression towards humans, especially our children, would have been immediately uh, removed and killed. The ones that successfully integrate with humans are the ones that tend to be more docile. Instead of natural selection guiding evolution, Human intervention changed the very nature of the protodogs. Long before there was a word for it, our ancestors became geneticists. And they created the wolf that didn't bite. And set the stage for all of our dogs. There is no history of dogs without humans solidly at their side. Dogs exist because we needed them. We needed them to protect us and to help us hunt. To gather our herds, haul our stuff, and later even heal us. And they do all this for us because they need us too. We humans have become their ecological niche. Our mutual need for nurturing and companionship keeps dogs near and dear to us in the 21st century. A recent genetic study provides clues of how all dog breeds are related and how they're all related to wolves. <laughs> 